evening, 508, 508, Blessed Redeemer. Let's all stand, shall we? Page 508. Of Calvary's mountain, on dreadful war, of Christ the Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, sing the Second, Father, forgive. see you all. Sick? Bob. Bob is sick. Pray for Bob. Paling. Been in bed. And he didn't fit. He, did he fish? Two days. I was fine. So you know you're sick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's how that goes. You say, you're sick. <laughs> no, I'm not. Right? Women, I'm not sick. We can't be sick. It's not in us. We're not wired that way. How'd katana practice go? Wonderful. Not ready for Christmas. Don't have to be, though, do I yet? Two and a half months. What are you looking at? You know the <laughs> Pray with me. Father, thank you for dying for us. Don't let us get to the point where we sing a hymn like we just sang and it not affect us. Thank you for what you did for us. Don't ever let us get over it. Thank you tonight, Lord. May you just bless our hearts, bless our souls. You can do it, Lord. It's, it's you. It's not any of our ability. It's not the singing that prepares us. We, we know that that has a function, but God, it's you. So please, please, just you do tonight what you can do. Bless Bob Paling. Give him strength. 
Lord, I'm sure there are others, and, and I know that some are just trying to get well and well enough to show up and be healthy. Don't let what they go through take away any of the joy or the motivation to live for God. And may you tonight in us help us to see uh, how we ought to live and why we ought to live, what we ought to live. Help us to see our purpose. I pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Page 512. All the way my Savior leads me. 512. come as they're coming you're aware of course what's happening I think we want to just if you can help we would like to give you an opportunity Jeremy's got a project that he's doing for someone here at church and if you've got some time tomorrow night would you see him if you can help out see Jeremy it's his birthday today 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 you can put the ball away I was putting on you okay thank you <laughs> thank you it's Jeremy's birthday today. Jeremy, let's do it now. <laughs> Should we do it now? Do it now. Yeah. Jeremy, come on out here, buddy. Show us all who you are. <laughs> Happy He was young and single. We never thought anybody would marry him. <laughs> Should I reword that? Hell in my mouth. Maybe I'll preach a message I preached this morning again tonight. I wasn't listening. Some of you weren't. How long have you been married? Not a, you're not a cow. I said, holy cow. <laughs> holy cow. Did, did it go fast for you? <laughs> yeah? Go fast for you? <laughs> How many of you have been married 12 years? How many of you think it feels longer? See him if you can help tomorrow night. Would you do that?
the banquet on Thursday. If you, it's too late. But if you can go, you'll have a good time, I promise. Sit at Roger's table, you'll have a good time. If you can go, it's free. You got to give up some time, but it, you'll be blessed. It's always, I love to hear stories about changed lives. Amen. If your life hasn't changed, something's wrong with you. So I love to hear stories of changed lives, and that's what that will be. There's other things there, but we're going to. We're going to pray. Give if you can. Father, thank you for sending your son. And thank you for allowing us to have a part of your work. Even when we give. And I don't think, oh, this isn't nothing. This won't help. You, God, you can take the, the little bitty uh, amount that the widow gave. And you said, hey, I saw that. I'll use that. Thank you, Lord, that, that you work that way. And uh, we want, God, we, we want to give. We don't want to just give so you bless us. We want to give because you want us to give. And we want to give because we want to give. And thank you that you said you give and you'll be blessed. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. and 15 Beulah Land page 515 let's all stand shall we we'll see the first and last verses page 515 I've reached the land of Gordon
needed. Cammy is going to come play on the violin now. that what it is? R.A.? Yes. Fiddling? That's not fiddling, is it? That's violinin. I'm sorry. I, let me get this on so y'all can hear. Because you can't hear me if I don't have it on. First Samuel. First Samuel. First Samuel, the 16th. You thought I was going to say 17. First Samuel. Some of you are too used to me. First Samuel. First ver verse, all of them. We're going to read the whole book of First Samuel. I want to see if you're listening. First Samuel, chapter 16. First Samuel. Say, so you're going to mention chapter 17? Maybe. First Samuel. First Samuel. I was reading through this chapter just because about once a month I open the Bible and read it because I figure I better say that I read it. So about once a month I get some time and I check in to see if you're listening. And I was reading this chapter because I love the 17th chapter, of course. I love the description of the battle of David and Goliath. I love that story. I'm looking forward to meeting David, by the way, when I'm in heaven. And uh, I, I don't think Goliath will be there. In fact, nobody over 5'8 will be in heaven. They're all giants. I'm looking forward to meeting Moses. I just can't imagine. I've, I've been reading about him my whole Christian life. And I'm looking forward to hugging them or shaking their hand. Looking forward to seeing Jesus, of course. Amen. And so I was thinking, mulling. And I went to chapter 16 and just read it a couple times and thought, wow, that this some interesting things here. Has David, in one instant, that one chapter, it goes from him being anointed, 1 Samuel 15, Saul is rejected because he did not follow God's instructions exactly. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. 
He did not follow what the Lord told him to do. He said he did, but he didn't. A lot of people say that. You know, the Lord can say anything he wants, but if you're not listening, it doesn't do any good. So, just could I give you some fatherly advice? Before you come to church, pray this prayer. Lord, help me to hear what I'm supposed to hear. Because I'd hate for you to waste preaching. This is where you say amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> we got to tell it to you. It is good. That's why the sign has been out of commission a little bit. You believe this is God's word? If you don't read it, it's not. If you're not reading it, it's not God's word. Say, well, that nullify, if I don't pick it up, open it, it stops being God's word for you. If you're not reading it, it can't be God's word to you. If you and I really thought it was God's word, we wouldn't go a day without it. I'm right. So as I, I want to read the whole chapter. Hope you got a minute. 1 Samuel 16. And in this chapter there, I, I, need, you, I need you to read it like I'm reading it. I need you to think about it. In order for you to get what I think, because I don't know how much you prayed about this sermon, but I prayed a lot about it. And in order for you to get what you really need to get, you need to... Get with my mindset as much as you can. And that's what the Lord wants. That's what the Lord... That's why other people have rejected what Jesus said to them in the Old Testament. But Saul, being a leader, he was more responsible, more accountable. That's why it really upset God. And by the way, it upset Samuel. When Samuel... He was suspicious that Saul had, you know, did Saul go and kill people? But did he do what he's supposed to do? Nope. No. So that's where you got to be careful. Because you can say, well, man, what does that old loudmouth preacher want? I'm in church. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter what I want. It matters that you do everything God tells you to do. But it's easy for us to deceive ourselves when we show up. Saul thought he did enough. When Samuel nailed it on him, he didn't say, man, that's me. You know what he said? Wasn't me. Was the people. And you know, that's scary when we start not taking the blame and start blaming others. So God rejects him. God says Saul will no longer be king. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, you have God's commission to Samuel to go to Jesse's house, David's dad, to go to his house and pick the next king of Israel. Here's what I want you to think about as we read this chapter. I don't want you to think about Saul. I don't want you to think about what Saul did. I don't want you to think about Saul being rejected. I want you to think about David. There's a reason that God picked David. And God is very picky. God doesn't just use anyone. The children of Israel, I, 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 I don't know how to say this. So if you could think like me as best you could, that will help. The, the children of Israel nagged God for a king. God knew what Saul was. And God knew that that was the wrong choice for the children of Israel to want a king like everybody else when God said, hey, I'll be your king. So when they said, we want someone tall, we want someone dark. We want someone handsome. Sound familiar? I know looking up here you're thinking, 
Are you talking about you? God said, if that's what you want, then I'll let you have it. And he did. And look what he did. So now God says to Samuel, we need a king. Obviously, Saul has blown it. He's proven it. I told them that they shouldn't allow uh, him to leave, but, but that's what they wanted. And so 1 Samuel 16, Samuel is told by God to go to Jesse's house. Read it with me. Think about David. Don't think about Saul. Oh, we're going to read his name. We're going, to read, we're going to see his brothers and Jesse. Think about David. David is a young boy, is chosen, literally, literally anointed to be the king of Israel. You and I know, we don't know him, but we know about him. You and I know that David loved God. And you and I know that David loved God, I think, as much as anybody could love God. Amen. Was he perfect? No. I want you to think about David as we go through this. And I'm going to help you, okay? I'm going to help you. You're not all, I, you, I'm going to help you. Tell me when you're ready. Ready. Thank you. Verse 1, the Lord said unto Samuel, How long? I take that to mean it's been long enough. How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? You know the great thing about praying to God is that he knows exactly what you need. Did you ever try to tell God what you thought you needed? <laughs> hey, God, it's me. Now, listen. One of the first things I pray for before I really begin praying is humility. Because I'll tend to be God when I'm praying. And I get on my knees and I might start saying, Dear Vito, rather than Dear Father. And sometimes we pray like that. Sometimes we're so forceful. Hey, you know where I'm coming from? So the Lord said, How long will you mourn for Saul? I have rejected him. Time's up. Let him go. That's what he is. He's proved himself. He's no good for Israel. God tells him, verse 1, Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Who's he talking about? Shema? Talking about David. So God knew that David, God knew, God knew, knew that David would be the next king of Israel, correct? Did he knew that David would fail? God knows every failing that will happen in your life, but he still wants to use us. So he tells Samuel, God says, oh, you're no more crying, no more whining about Samuel. He, he, that's it. Fill your horn with oil. You're going to Jesse's house. I've got a new king there, verse 2, and Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he'll kill me. Samuel knew what kind of guy Saul was. Obviously, already, before God even picked, listen to me, you ought to thank God for your conscience. Because the conscience of Saul was eating him alive, and Samuel knew it. Stay with me now. I, a lot of Bible history, a lot of Bible stories, all relevant. Samuel says, if I go to Jesse's with oil, Saul will hear, track me down, and kill me. 
You know how, God, you know how he is. I've been mourning for him. I've been pleading that you change him. I've been pleading that his life would change. And then all of a sudden, the Lord said, verse 2, take a heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call, verse 3, call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. Who picked Saul? The Israelites. Who's picking David? God. Who picked Saul? I'm not trying to mix you up. You should get a nap so you can keep up. Who picked Saul? The Israelites. Did Saul fail? Yes. Who picked David? God. Did he fail? God, don't miss that. God allows us to do whatever we want to do. We are in control of what we do. I choose whether I let God fill me. I choose whether or not I obey God. God doesn't force himself on me and say, you're going to do what I tell you to do. God says, here's what you ought to do. And so he says, Samuel, you need to get to Jesse's, and I, I will show you who to anoint, because you'll anoint him unto me, because I'll name him. Verse 4, and Samuel did that which the Lord spake. I love that phrase. Samuel did that. He knew his life was in jeopardy. He knew that Saul was a nut. Sorry. I mean, you start asking witches for spiritual advice, you're nuts. Something's wrong with you. So Samuel says, it, it fear, Lord, I'm fearing. If I go, if someone finds out, what, what's the oil for? Where are you going? Well, I'm going to Jesse's. They're, they're, the new king's there. Samuel said, he, Lord, you know he'll kill me. So he said, you just tell him you're going to sacrifice. And he said, you get Jesse, you call him, you guys sacrifice, and then I'll show you what to do. Verse 4, and Samuel did that which the Lord spake. Verse 4, he came to Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, comest thou peaceably. You know what that means? That means that preachers and prophets all to be feared. You know what they do now? They mock us. I have people going to me all the time. They'll talk. Aren't you a preacher? They'll we'll talk. I won't know them. They'll say, oh, you're a preacher. Hey, how about well, this one guy? Like, I, you know, I don't want to hear it. I mean, don't, don't tarnish me because he's tarnished. You just met me. We're not all bad, but that's what they think. But thank God when they saw Samuel come, they said, uh-oh. They didn't say, oh, we like him. He, he's soft-spoken. Everywhere he goes, everybody just follows him like a pied pie. They said, uh-oh, are you coming peaceably? What are you going to do? Verse 5, he said, peaceably. He said, I'm come to sacrifice unto the Lord. He said, sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and he called them to the sacrifice. Verse 6, and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab. He only could judge Eliab by what he saw. So verse 6 says, he looked on Eliab and said, surely. You're not reading ahead, are you? I stop. Some of you, your lips are still moving. Samuel looked at, at Eliab. Man, just by what he saw, he was impressed. Don't be. God doesn't pick them that way. Samuel, even Samuel, Samuel who knew God, Samuel who people were scared of, Samuel who God had chosen to be the prophet that, that God would use and anoint as a young boy, he spoke to Samuel. Come to town and people go, uh-oh. They go, hey, everything good. We don't want you calling down any fire. No, no, no. He said, I'm good. They go to Jesse's house. He tells Jesse, I thank God. 
got the new king. He told me the king's here. So, so maybe Jesse said, you know what, we'll start oldest, but they, he's it, man. Look at this guy. Samuel looks at Eliab, and it says there, verse 6, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Question, was Samuel wrong? Yeah. But all he had was what he could see. And he decided that just by what he saw, maybe that's how God was doing this. But God knows so much more, doesn't he? Verse 7, but the Lord said unto Samuel, he shut it down right away. He didn't want him to keep doing that. He said, look not on his countenance. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. Because I have refused him. Saul was tall. That didn't go over very well. God was saying, Samuel, don't get caught up in this trap of what you're used to. I'm picking. I'm the one doing the pick. I'm the one. You just follow me. So Samuel opens his mouth and says, Eli, man, look at him. He's handsome. He's tall. He's dark. He was dark because he's a Jew. He, he said, this has got to be the guy. Surely. And so the Lord interjects. He says, hey, but the Lord said, verse 7, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord, look at it, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Question, can men see the heart? But God can. So that's why we should let the Lord do that. We, we churches candidate a new pastor, they go, uh, uh, Pastor, we want your advice on this. And I always tell them, when he comes in, man, I would nail him. I'd get his wife alone. I'd ask her. I'd make her think that she's in a Nazi concentration camp. I would put her through the mill. I would ask her questions so she'll spill the beans. Because you'll be better off to get the beans spilled now than call this guy in and have something blow up. I said, I would not let him come and preach any message he's already preached. I would make him prepare. And they're like, we never thought of that. Like, you need to think of it. You're, you're hiring God's man. And you're not looking at his outside. You're trying to see his inside. And so you pray. You pray. You beg God. And so they'll go. I, they walk up to me. They go, well, we, inter, we interviewed our candidate, another guy. They didn't want him. And so I don't know what to say. I, I just say, well, imagine that. It takes prayer. You guys ought to be praying. You ought to pray with him. Have a candidate come. Tell him we're not preaching. We're going to pray. We're just going to beg God to show us if you're the man. And you know what? God, I've found, can give you peace that passes understanding. We don't do that. It's a big beauty contest. You ever seen the dog shows? See where they strut the dog and the dog walks just right? Stops. They turn him and he walks just right? That's how churches candidate preachers. I'm right. They want to make sure he walks right. They look at the labels of his suit, make sure he's wearing the right suit. Listen to me. God sees the heart. And if God knows the heart, we better be going to God when we need help. God said, Samuel, don't you fall into this trap looking on the outward appearance. I don't see that. He said, the Lord doesn't look like you look. Man looks on that. He said, I see the heart. Verse 8. Then Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel, and he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Sounds like Samuel's listening to the Lord. Huh? Anything would be better than Saul. Maybe Samuel's ready to say, Eliab, yeah, we'll take him. Here comes Abinadab. He looks good. You know how they say, this is the same principle as not going to the grocery store when you're hungry. Everything looks good. 
When I go to the grocery store, I'm always hungry. If I'm not, I am when I get there because I see food. And now where they make you walk in, they're usually cooking something right there because you can't smell bologna through the package. Do you ever have fried bologna? Man, it's good. Anyway, don't distract me. Now they're cooking some. Now they got going to Martin's. Man, they've got chicken. They're making, they, they should be making cookies. If they start baking cookies at Martin's, I would move there. I would have my mail sent there. Verse 9. Jesse made shame of the pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Verse 10. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Well, how did he know that? Because he knew what God sees. He's following God. Verse 11. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? He said, There remain yet the youngest. And behold, I didn't even have him come. God, here's Jesse. God cannot rule a people with a shepherd. Can I remind you of a verse? The Lord seeth not as man seeth. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And so Samuel said, I don't know what to do. You've shown me all your sons. And God said, no, but God said, he's here. There's got to be somebody else. And Jesse said, I didn't even call. I had no use. He's a shepherd. I love Samuel's response. Verse 11. Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him. In other words, have somebody grab him and pull him in here. Like a dog would grab, fetch a stick. Don't let go. Have somebody grab him and get him here. He said, send and fetch him. For we will not sit down till he come hither. Verse 12. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. And with all of a beautiful countenance. Goodly to look at. You know what Samuel said? Man, i got to be careful. This isn't how God picks. He's a shepherd boy. I don't get this. Listen, God will do things just so you don't trust yourself. He'll stir you up just so you don't get used to it. I don't do that. I know that. God will throw you off on purpose so you have to trust Him. Verse 12. Arise, the end says, the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. From that day forward, so Samuel rose up, went to Ramah. Verse 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now don't, don't, what did I tell you to think of when we're reading this? Think about David. We're not done with David. Think about David. Verse 14. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. An evil spirit and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Say, what's that mean? I'm not sure. Don't get all worked up over it. Let God be God. Let God do what he does. You say, well, I, I don't understand that. Well, just let God be God. If God does that to you, you'll understand it. So you're better off not to know what that means, aren't you? I don't know. I don't want to know what an evil spirit from the Lord is to trouble me. Do you? I, I want the Holy Spirit to come upon me. I, 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 don't, I look, you don't have to get hit by a train to go, ooh, that was bad. I mean, you can imagine, can't you? You don't have, don't get all caught up. Well, we're supposed to understand all of God's word. When, when you get there, let me know. Because I'm going to kiss your feet. When you understand God's word, I mean, take your shoes off. You won't. Samuel, verse, verse 15, Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord Command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man 
who's cunning, who's a cunning player on the heart. It shall come to pass when the evil spirit of God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. And Saul, excuse me, Saul said unto his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Hmm, 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 hmm. Look up here. You don't, you're not reading, are you? Saul said, hey, whatever's going on, I, I need something. And we need somebody. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Isn't it great that God's in control? Saul said to his servants, verse 70, provide me. A man can play well. Verse 18, then answered one of his servants and said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, a mighty Valiant man, a man of war, and prudent in manners, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Look up. Did Saul know that Samuel anointed David to be king? Probably not. Because God didn't push Saul off the throne and set David. David still had some things to learn. And one of the things, this is so cool. One of the things that David had to learn, watch this, it blows my mind. Verse 19, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, send me David. Oh. Does God know what he's doing? Always. Do you sometimes doubt what God's doing? A lot. Does God always know what he's doing? All the time. Saul says, send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. slam -a -roni. That's what that is. Yeah, that, you know, that one bumping sheep. I don't know if you know this, but sheep aren't ferocious. You know, people don't get watch sheep to protect their house. They don't have signs that say, beware. Of the sheep. You hit up the sheep, they're gone, man. They're gone. They'll, they'll run in water and drown. They're so timid. Send me David, thy son. He's no threat. Which is with the sheep. Verse 20. Follow me. Follow this now. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. I would have never done that. I would have sent him some poison mushrooms. If my son was the next king, we need to get rid of this guy. Man, this, this guy's too. But what does Jesse do? He treats him like he ought to. He sends David to his house. Watch this, watch this. Verse 21, David came to Saul. And stood before him. And he loved him greatly. He loved him greatly. David loved Saul. And he became his armor bearer. Saul sent to Jesse saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me. For he hath found favor in my sight. Hey, you know when somebody loves you. Think about it. Think about it. Don't you want somebody around you that loves you? Think about how many people were mad at Saul. Think about the, the, the attitude, uh, the personality. When Samuel said, if you send me to Jesse's house and Saul finds out, he'll kill me. Who's God send to Saul after the evil spirit from God is troubling Saul? God works it all out. So David goes. Because God knew the kind of person David was. And it says when David got there, not only did he take gifts. Verse 21, he loved him greatly. Verse 23, it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul. That David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Let me run you through some 
background preliminaries. 1 Samuel 15 and verse 1, God anointed Saul just like Samuel anointed David to be king. 1 Samuel 15, 1, God anoints Saul to be king. Samuel says, uh, Samuel said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, hearken thou. Verse 1, 1 Samuel 15, verse 1, Samuel told Saul, Now therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. The command to Saul was precise. If you're close and you should be able to turn there, 1 Samuel 15, verse 5 and 6, it says, And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said, The Kenites go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. God said in verse 3, 1 Samuel 15, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. It seems like in 1 Samuel 15, verse 5 and 6, that Saul is trying to improve upon what God commanded him to do. Verse 1 Samuel made it clear he was supposed to hearken to God. And verse 6 says, Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites. So he's, he is improving, if you will, he's improving upon what God said. That's where it started. When God tells you to do something, don't think about it. Do it. Don't say, well, you know what I think, and that's the danger of knowing a little Bible or a lot of Bible. You think you know everything that God knows, and you don't. And so you have to say, God, what do you want? Once Saul, I I'm convinced, once Saul decided to spare the Kenites, it became easy to violate God's command. Look at me. Is there anything wrong? Don't think about what God told I'm not asking you what God said. I'm asking you in general. Is it wrong to tell people to run because they might die? No. Unless God tells you, kill them all. You see, you know, preacher, I don't get that either. I don't either. But I'm not God. And God does things the way he, he does things. So God had chosen Saul and David. For leadership. They're both anointed by God. But it seems like everything else in their lives is opposite. David grew in his relationship with God. Saul goes away from God. Saul starts out right. And he fails to hearken to the Lord's voice. And that one thing cost him the blessing of God. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 9 says. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen of the fatlings of the land of all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Verse 19, wherefore, Samuel tells him, wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? but didst fly upon the spoil. You took what you wanted. And he said, verse 19, 1 Samuel 15, you did evil in the sight of the Lord. The same God and the same heavenly resources were available to Saul and David. Saul had no excuse to obey God. Or not to obey God. He had the same power. He had the same Holy Spirit. Verse 14 of 1 Samuel 16 says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Boy, I'll tell you what. When I read New Testament verses like this, quench not the Spirit. When I read verses that say, Grieve not the Holy Spirit. 
my mind goes right back to Saul. How it's possible for us to go against the very God that lives in us. David chose to hearken unto God as much as he could. Hallelujah. David chose to do what he could do. He said, I'm going to do. But Saul said, I'm not going to. Saul had the same Holy Spirit. Saul had the same capacity to do that. Samuel has to remind Saul that it was more important 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22, he has to remind him that it's more important to hearken to God than offer God an animal sacrifice. What a verse, verse 22. He says, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken, it's better than the fat of rams. Well, you know what I do for God? I don't care what you do. Do you obey? Do you know? Listen, let me say it publicly. That was a problem when I came to this church. Without mentioning names, if he's watching, I'm sorry you got to hear this. When I came here, it was this attitude. I don't know about obeying, but I know I sacrifice. And according to the Bible, it says it's better to obey. It's better to hearken than no matter what you can give and what you can do. Samuel reminds Saul that it was more important, don't miss that, to hearken to God than to offer God an animal sacrifice. You and I have to make sure that we repeatedly know that we're going in the direction that God wants us to go, that we hearken to God's voice exactly. Well, I'm close. God doesn't want you close. He wants you exact. Well, I do all I can. Well, maybe you should ask me what I think about that because maybe I can help you see it like you don't see it. Obedience to God is not a snap decision. Obedience to God is when you and I decide to follow God and allow the Spirit of God to direct our life. David is anointed the next king of Israel. He goes back to the sheep. Follow me, follow me. He goes back to the sheep. He waits for God to call him to serve. Man, he's ready. Can you imagine what's going through his mind? Oil's dripping down. Samuel takes out that horn. He pours oil over David's head so it would run from his head, across his eyes, down his nose, across his lips, down his chin, his neck, his chest, all the way past his stomach and, and his midsection, his thighs, all the way to his feet and toes. And that was God saying, I own you. Everywhere the oil touches, that's mine. Sanctify means set apart. And Samuel, I hope, said that to David. Now David, as this oil drips across your body, that's God taking that. That's his. He's your new owner. Wherever the oil touches, God owns that. Man, I can't imagine David standing there feeling that oil run across his body. And then saying, maybe he said to Samuel, now, now wait a minute, what does God want me to do? You're setting me apart for God. What does he want? And Samuel said, David, don't you understand? God has chosen you to be the next king of Israel. Would you say, look up here, would you say, oh great. I would fall on my knees at that very place. And say, dear God, I'm not worthy. I would say, Samuel, are you sure? Samuel, are you absolutely positive? Are you sure it wasn't a liar? Are you sure it wasn't a bit of death? Are you sure it wasn't Shema? You sure you got the right guy? Samuel said, look, I thought it was a liar. 
And David said, he's the oldest, he's the biggest, he looks the best, his shoulders are the broad, it should be him. Samuel said, no, no, listen, David, when I said, I know that's him, you know what God told me? I'll pick. I'll pick. You just be, I'll pick. And then David, you weren't here. I thought it was one of your brothers, David. I didn't know it would be you. God, God picked you. Let me tell you something. If you weren't humble by that point, you'd be humble. David goes back to the sheep. All this is trying to compute. I don't know about you, but if God chose me to be a king, I, I, where do you look? I mean, he didn't have a phone to look up king. How to be a king. He didn't have an encyclopedia. He didn't have something that he could check and find out exactly what to do. But verse 18, 1 Samuel 16, verse 18 says, one of the servants got to him and said, Hey, Saul, Saul wants you. They knew what this guy was. They said that he is cunning and playing, mighty, valiant, a man of war, prudent. Comely, the Lord is with him. During that time, I think he's dealing with the fact that God had rejected Saul. And at some point, whenever that was, God would entirely push Saul out of the way and grab David and put him on the throne. You know what? Let me remind you, you can't go very long rejecting God's voice without it being evident to those around you. Look at what verse 14 and 15 says. It says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Saul knew full well that God had rejected him. He lost his grip on God. But David had a grip on God. In fact, Somebody that didn't know David that well, one of Saul's servants, was aware of David's godly life. Hey, that's why God chose him. You say, preacher, I'll never be a king. You ought to be ready to be one. I mean, I don't think it's a good enough excuse. Someone asked me, do you pastor that church like you'd pastor a great big church in a great big town? And my only response is, I hope so. I don't think people are different when there's more of them. I think you just have more of the same problem. But I don't think you have, oh, I've never dealt with that before. David was alone with the sheep when God chose him to be king. He spent time, listen to me, he spent time alone walking with God and now he's anointed to be king. And after being anointed, he goes back to the sheep. Why? To be alone with God. Don't miss that. You've got to be alone with God. You've got to have, I call it, you've got to have a secret place. You'll never be what God wants you to be. And if you're complaining about what you are now, maybe you ought to start trying to be what God wants you to be and God will put you in somewhere else. Maybe God will give you something else. It's extremely crucial. I can't say this enough. You hear me say it all the time. It's extremely crucial that you and I spend time alone with God and we don't see that in Saul. No wonder Saul, no wonder Saul didn't go after Goliath. He didn't have the confidence that David did. No wonder Saul feared fighting God's enemy. He hadn't been walking with God. The Lord wasn't with him. But remember, let's bring it up. 1 Samuel 17, remember, David ran after Goliath. Man, he got in Goliath's face. I love it. He didn't go, hey, I'm coming close. Just hold off now. Let's make this fair. Man, David runs upon on Goliath. Goliath didn't know what to do. Goliath starts bad-mouthing him. David said, talk all you want. I'm going to load my sling. 
Goliath said, you got a little rock in a sling. You can't. I got a guy with a, a plate of armor. And my sword's bigger than you are. My spear weighs more than you. David said, I'm ready now. God said, do what you got to do. Boom, hit him in the head, he went down. He didn't hesitate. Life is lived more easily when you know God is with you. You can go after things. You can trust God. You can be confident. I mean, do you understand? There should be a boldness about us. There should be a confidence. There should be a, a certainty where we know God is around. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 23 came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp. He played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. Music should stir our heart and give us the right spirit. It shouldn't make our body move. Say, there you go again. You're welcome. Music isn't for your body. When I played rock and roll, that was for your body. Music is not for you. It's for your soul. It's for your heart. That's why the devil has been so successful at using music. Years ago, when I was in Bible college, Ron Hamilton and Frank Garlock showed up and they held a, a music seminar at the church in town. Ron Hamilton got up, he had a great big boom box. That's all we had back in the late 70s, early 80s. Remember boom boxes? Great big boom box. I thought, man, what's he going to do with that? Because I was used to people carrying them, you know, going down the street or skating. And he goes, I want to play you something. I want you to guess what it is. Man, he hit that play button. Something came out of that thing, and it took me right back. Listen to me. Took me right back to the nightclubs. Took me right back to, to the hard, hard rock, the 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 evil life, and he goes, he clicked stop. He goes, you know who that was? Now, this is the late 70s, early 80s. He said that was the Gaither Vocal Band. He said some of you had a hard time holding still, didn't you? Boy, I was ready to get up, thought, man, maybe they're letting us dance. Maybe they're telling us, maybe I'm in the right place. I heard about all that this Marantha Baptist, whatever it was, and maybe, maybe they dance here. He said, they're, they're selling that as Christian music. Let me make a couple of points, and I'll be done. Once sin gets into your life, whether the devil uses music, he uses it as a tool, as a weapon to capture you. Once you allow sin to get in your life, it becomes more attractive to you. May I read you a verse? Ecclesiastes. You can jot it. If you want to go there, you can. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. Listen very closely. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. In other words, if you don't get evil out of your life as quick as you can, it says, therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Once sin gets into your life, it becomes more attractive. That's why some of you that have gotten into sin, it's hard for you to get out. If you don't do something about it right away, it just keeps growing like cancer. I'll say to people, what about the music at your church? Boy, you know, I hate the music. I just go for the preaching. Now I'll say, think about that. 
How can God honor his word when for 40 minutes they've done nothing but appeal to the flesh? I'm right. You could go, well, I, you know, I just don't agree with that. You'll see it. Someday you'll see it. Saul never imagined. Listen, Saul never imagined that ignoring God's command to slay the Amalekites would lead him to try to kill the next king of Israel. Did David run for his life from Saul? You know why? Because he allowed sin to get into his life. And he never imagined that ignoring God's command would cause him to want to kill the next king of Israel. He must have thought that it didn't matter and that he could get away with it. David went after God's enemy, Goliath, in the name of the Lord. I love, I love this story. You ought to go home tonight and read it again. He, he, he identifies himself with God, and he wasn't ashamed. He said, the battle is the Lord. David could fight that battle and win because the Lord was in the right place in his life. But Saul wouldn't go. When David said, I feel compelled to fight Goliath, remember what Saul said? Go and the Lord be with thee. Let me ask you a question. Technically, was the Lord supposed to be with Saul? Yes, could he have been? Yes. God God was not a formula to David. God was real to him. You ought to come to church. You ought to read your Bible. You ought to witness to the lost. You ought to give your money to God because God is real to you. Do you know how many people just have this formula? They just... That's what we do. We show up. You go, man, you realize what's happening. You realize, the, uh, well, you know, I've been there a long time. God's not real to them. God's a formula. If you ignore God, it's going to lead you where you never thought it would. David said, David said, I'll love Saul. I'll love him. Maybe that will help him. Saul still turned on him. David became king. Remember what they said about Saul? He has killed his thousands. But David has killed his, that's the highest number they had, Tens of thousands. How do you want to die? You're going to die. Or get raptured. Either way, you're going to meet God. How do you want to meet God? Do you want to meet God going all out? You want to meet God being right with Him? Or do you want God just to be some formula? Hey, we don't do everything here according to formula. That, that, uh, this, this is not about going through the formula. This is about God being real to us. I want God, I want God to be so real to you that the only thing you can do is get alone with him and love him and do what he wants you to do. Bow your head, close your eyes, every head bowed, every eye closed. My dear Father, Thank you for allowing us to know you. Thank you, dear Father, that you can be real to us. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for the blessing of your word. Thank you for the blessing of prayer. When I don't know what else to do, I can always pray. 
When I don't know where I can go, I can pray. When I don't have the answers, I can pray. When I'm frustrated, I can pray. When I'm discouraged, I can pray. Thank you that I can always come to you. Help me not to ignore what you want me to do. Help me not to do something that I think is okay without checking with you. Help me to make sure that you're leading me. Help me to look on the right thing. Help me to look to you. You told Samuel, don't look at him. Don't look at him. Look at his heart. Dear God, help us to see the heart of people. Help us to have a heart that when they look at us, they see a heart. As they said about David, man, we look at David, Saul's, Saul's old man said, man, when you look at this guy, all you see is the Lord is with him. God, help us, help us to be seen like that by others. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. You say, preacher, oh, preacher. I want God to see my heart. I want others to be able to say the Lord is with me. You know why Saul was frustrated. You know why Saul lost it because God departed from him. He didn't have to. Saul said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to ignore what God said. I'm going to do part of what God said. And man, that just led to his destruction. He ended up killing himself. You say tonight, your head bowed, your eyes closed, old preacher. I want to do exactly what God wants me to do. I want to spend time alone with God. I want to follow God. I want other people to be able to look at me and know, hey, they have the right heart. They follow God. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. Preacher, God, speak to me. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Preacher, God, speak to me. God, speak to me. Up and down, up and down. Dear Father, may you just move in our hearts. May you be more real to us before we leave than you were when we came in. Please, Holy Spirit, make that happen. Please, I ask this in Jesus' name. Pianos play. You're standing. Come on. If you need to come, you bother me. If I look like I'm praying, I might be. But if you need to bother me, just bother me. Come on. Come on. God, speak in your heart. Don't leave this place without God being more real to you. That's your decision. Saul could have done that. He decided not to. David decided to do that, and look where he was. You say, but he failed. Yeah, but look at his life. What a great man. What a great man. God, speak in your heart. Come on. Come on. God love Saul of course he did and David knew that so David loved him in fact when Saul pursued David to kill him David wouldn't wouldn't kill Saul he called him the Lord's anointed and all of David's men said man David you need to just kill this guy and get it over with David said, God didn't tell me to do that. Make sure you're doing what God tells you to do. Pray with me. Father, I ask for your power. The devil's out to get us all. That's just a fact. He'll corrupt us. He'll smear us. He'll do anything he has to to disrupt our way. But may we do exactly what you want us to do. May we follow your word precisely. May we do all that you want. May we do it your way. May we look to you when we don't know what to do. And follow, follow your voice. Not our opinion, 
Not, not our wisdom. You said the, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Help us to follow your wisdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.